Welcome to the second part of our exploration of the U.S. Census, presented by the Alabama Department of Archives and History. My name is Courtney Pinkard, and I'm a reference archivist and the coordinator of the EBSCO Research Room. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on the non-population schedules of the census. These commonly overlooked resources will add new dimensions to your ancestors' stories, from showing how many acres of land they owned and which crops they grew, to what industries operated in their communities, what educational opportunities were available in their area, and even what taxes they may have paid. This slide lists the non-population schedules that are available for Alabama, along with the years they were taken. Due to time constraints, the last schedule on this list, the Triple D classes, will not be covered in this presentation. We will, however, take a look at each of the other schedules individually with examples to show how they can be used. The first schedules we'll focus on are the agricultural schedules. These schedules document land ownership and farming operations in each county. The schedules list the name of the farm owner, agent, or manager, the amount of land owned, and the crops and livestock cultivated on that property. You can calculate how much total land an individual owned by adding the improved and unimproved acreage together. You'll see that cash values were assigned to the land, farming equipment, livestock, orchards, homemade goods, and slaughtered animals. Keep in mind, not all farms were included on this schedule. Depending on the year, the farm had to meet certain size and value criteria to be included. Also note that with the exception of the 1880 Agricultural Schedule, they are all two pages long. The 1880 Schedule was reorganized to capture all of the information on a single page. This example is taken from the 1870 Agricultural Schedule for Baker County, Alabama, which changed its name to Chilton County shortly after the census was taken. The highlighted line is that of Alfred Baker, the man the county was briefly named for. We can see that Mr. Baker owned nearly 700 acres of land and was actively farming 100 acres of it. Compared to the other farms pictured, Baker's farm had the highest value. He owned two horses, two working oxen, 14 head of beef cattle, 60 sheep, and 30 pigs. He also grew corn. Flipping the page, we see that his farm produced wool, thanks to the sheep, and Mr. Baker must have also kept bees because the farm produced 15 pounds of honey that year. Here we have another Chilton County agricultural schedule. This one is from 1880. The names in the box have special significance to me. The first name, Anderson Honeycutt, is my fifth great grandfather. The two men below him, Lewis and Jasper, are his sons, and Jasper is my fourth great grandfather. Now, if you know anything about Chilton County, you'll know that some of the finest peaches in the world are grown there. I wanted to know if my Honeycutt ancestors grew peaches, which is an orchard crop that's included in the 1880 schedule. Moving further down the page under the orchard section, we see that both Anderson and Jasper grew peaches on their farms. Jasper had twice the number of trees planted that his father had, and they also grew apples. The next schedule type we'll take a look at are the industry schedules. These schedules documented the industries and manufacturers of the county. Alabamians engaged in all kinds of industry, from grist mills to candy manufacturing. The schedule usually shows what kinds of materials were consumed by the industry, as well as the amount of product that was generated. Another interesting facet of manufacturing is how the industry was powered. Some examples include water, steam, horses, and even by hand. This example of the 1850 industrial schedule is from Prattville in Otago County, and I've highlighted the section of a well-known business owner from the area, Daniel Pratt. At this point in time, Mr. Pratt is running a cotton factory and sawmill, most likely on Otago Creek. At his cotton factory, he reported spending $50,000 on cotton, the primary raw material required for the industry. 
he turned the cotton into Osnaburg fabric and sheeting, which he valued at $84,780. While the business required a substantial investment in raw material, it was at least recouping the cost on the production side. Moving ahead 10 years, we find Mr. Pratt again in 1860. By now he has turned his cotton factory into a cotton gin factory, and he's also operating a foundry to supply his factory with iron castings for the gins. The total value of the 1,500 cotton gins manufactured by his factory is $288,750, which is equivalent to almost $9 million in today's money. Next, we'll discuss the mortality schedules. These schedules record deaths that occurred in the calendar year prior to the census being taken. The calendar year runs from June 1st of the previous year to May 31st of the census year. For example, if the census year is 1850, then only the deaths that happened between June 1st, 1849 and May 31st, 1850 will be shown in the mortality schedule for that census. As you can see, this is a very narrow window of time and only a small portion of the county's deaths will be captured within it. During the slavery period, enslaved people were also included in these schedules under the name of their owner. From this schedule, you may learn the deceased person's age, place of birth, profession, cause of death, and the length of their illness. The example shown is from the 1860 mortality schedule taken in Lowndes County. Here we can see the names of three slaves enumerated under Mr. B.B. Rudolph, their owner. The first entry is an adult field hand named Pompey. He died in February 1859 of pneumonia, and he was sick for about a day and a half. The third name given is Gracie. She also died of pneumonia, but she lingered for over three weeks before she passed away at just 11 years old. Notice her occupation is listed as field hand, just like the two adult men listed above her. Social Statistics captured a, captures a wealth of information about each county. Data points included are educational pursuits like colleges, libraries, and newspapers, economic interests such as taxes and wages, and religious practices as demonstrated by the denomination and capacity of churches in the area. Each decade becomes a little more detailed with the information collected. The year 1870 has a question mark beside it on this slide because on Ancestry.com some counties have both 1860 and 1870 social statistics combined, even though the website makes it look like only 1860 is available. Let's see if we can guess some Alabama counties based on the data collected about them in 1860. This county's educational institutions included the State of Alabama University, which employed eight teachers and enrolled just 100 students. If you guessed Tuscaloosa, then you were correct, and Roll Tide. This county had two newspapers operating in 1860, the Cahaba Gazette and the Slaveholder, which was a state's rights political publication. Any ideas? If you said Dallas, then you're right. And finally, this county had several Roman Catholic churches listed on the schedule, but the largest could hold 3,500 congregants in a building worth $160,000 in 1860. Any guesses? This one is Mobile. Another interesting feature of the social statistics schedule is taxation information. On this page from Cherokee County, we can see the kinds of personal property that the county levied taxes on. At this time, there was a tax on watches, clocks, bowie knives, pistols, among other things. From this page, we can learn that there were 588 clocks kept for use by the inhabitants of the county, while there were just four bowie knives and revolvers being taxed. 
Now that we've covered all the non-population schedules and seen examples of the types of information they can provide, let's focus on a single entry from a schedule and see what we can learn about that person. In the 1870 industry schedule for Tuscaloosa County, there is a watchmaker named James B. Selleck. He makes about $1,000 a year repairing watches for his clients. Using our subscription to newspapers.com, I was able to find an advertisement that Mr. Selleck ran for his business in the Independent Monitor newspaper. This ad indicates that Selleck's shop was one door down from a doctor's office in a place called Hornet Row. The location given in the advertisement made me very curious. Having lived in Tuscaloosa during grad school, I had never heard of a place called Hornet Row. I asked my co-worker, who also lived in Tuscaloosa, and she hadn't heard of it either. After some searching, I came across a manuscript held by the Houle Special Collections Library at the University of Alabama. This document was a typed transcription of a reminiscence about Hornet Row written in 1890. The author, a Mr. Wyman, gave a thorough description of the location and people associated with it. He explained that Hornet Row was on the west side of 23rd Avenue between 5th and 6th Streets, a long row of one-story wooden offices, a total of eight in all. The offices were built around 1826, and their original tenants were young lawyers and a prominent doctor. The arrows on this map show the block which Mr. Wyman describes. With street names in mind, I accessed an 1884 Sanborn map of Tuscaloosa, which shows structures and street numbers. The box at the bottom of the image highlights eight structures on the west side of Monroe Street, which eventually became 23rd Avenue. These eight buildings are the original eight apartments of Hornets Row, where Mr. Selleck's watch repair shop operated roughly 15 years before this map was created. Of course, we can also find Mr. Selleck in the Federal Census Population Schedule. Here is his entry from 1870, which shows his wife Sarah and his daughters Genevieve and Mary. Surprisingly, none of the Selleck family are native Southerners. James was born in New York, and his wife is originally from Canada. As far as I've been able to tell, James and Sarah left New York in the mid-1850s and initially settled in Perry County before moving to Tuscaloosa. Using linked records on Ancestry.com, I was able to find Mr. Selleck's Find a Grave Memorial page, which illuminated another interesting piece of his life story. This marker next to his tombstone indicates he served in the Confederate Army. With our Fold 3 subscription, available for free in the research room, I verified his service as a lieutenant in the 28th Alabama Infantry Regiment. I even found a copy of his signature on some requisition forms he submitted to request supplies for the men of his company. James Selleck died in Florida in 1888 at the age of 65. So what did we learn about Mr. Selleck? Well, we know his age and place of birth. We know approximately when he moved from New York to Alabama. We know the names, ages, and birthplaces of his wife and children. We know his profession and where his business was located. We know about his military service, including when he enlisted and his rank. And we know when he died and where he was buried. All of this information grew from a single entry on the 1870 industrial schedule. This concludes our brief look at the non-population schedules. We hope this presentation was informative and useful. Be sure to check out our other presentations posted to YouTube, including the first part of our look at the federal census, presented by reference archivist Erica Eaves. We plan to host in-house workshops again in the fall, so please join us in August, September, and October. You can always find agency news and updates on our website at archives.alabama.gov. Thank you so much for watching.